Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present Gross Pathology Challenge 39. This one is going to be in the traditional short answer format. Look at all the great people that have helped me out with the next five gross path challenges. Thank you so much for all your help and for all your great pictures, which allow me to put these together. Okay, let's go ahead, get out our pens, our paper, and let's begin. Slide number one is tissue from a quail. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. The morphologic diagnosis for this particular lesion is a multifocal coalescing ulcerative enteritis. The cause is Clostridium colinum, and the name of the disease has been referred to as quail disease or ulcerative enteritis. This is a distinct uh, clostridium that affects bobwhite quail the worst, but it can see in a wide variety of birds, including poultry, but does not affect waterfowl. It usually goes after younger animals between four to 12 weeks of age, but adults can be affected as well. And this multifocal punctate enteritis, areas of necrosis with this hemorrhagic halo is very characteristic. You can also see areas of necrosis in the liver. Remember, whenever you have ulcerative enteritis, those organisms will have access to the portal system, so it often ends up in the liver, but you can see areas of necrosis in the spleen as well. A couple of potential differentials. Necrotic enteritis is a disease of poultry which doesn't affect quail caused by Clostridium perfringens type A or C, generally doesn't cause any liver lesions. Histomonas may affect quail, but it doesn't cause lesions in the small intestine. The lesions in the GI tract would be seen in the cecum. Okay, let's move on. Slide number two is tissue from a cat. And I would like for you to give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, time's up. <clears throat> this is a very classic lesion in a cat. Whenever you're looking at the kidneys of the cat and you see white nodules on the surface of the kidney, you want to think of two things. You want to think of renal lymphoma or feline infectious peritonitis. And then the big question is, is it tracking vessels or not? Feline infectious peritonitis caused by a mutated feline coronavirus, which gains the ability to survive within macrophages, which makes it a persistent infection. These, ves these lesions almost always track vessels. They're extremely vascular oriented. You can see here, here in the, a typical vascular tree, they're somewhat concentrated around the vessels. So I would lean toward uh, feline infectious peritonitis in this particular case. Your morphologic diagnosis should be based on the fact that this is primarily a, vas a vasculitis. So I would use multifocal to coalescing, lymphocytic, or you could go lymphoplasmacytic, or you could go lymphohistiocytic, you could say pyogranulomas because no two lesions of FIP look alike. The one thing they all have in common is they track vessels. So let's go with the multifocal coalescing lymphoplasmacytic renal vasculitis with nephritis. Because there's always nephritis as these inflammatory cells, they will invade the adjacent tissue. They'll expand into it, but it's not a primarily nephritis. It's a primary vasculitis. Why are the vessels affected? Well, if you have a persistent viral infection, the body is going to make antibodies against that viral antigen, but they're ineffective. And then the virus will continue to, to proliferate and proliferate. You get lots of viral antigen. You'll get lots of antibodies over time. That's why these often in chronic stages have a, a profound plasmacytic component. And eventually you'll get so much antigen antibody complexes, they will come out of circulation and then they lodge in the basement membranes of vessels all over the body. And these vessels will be the focus of attack by the body because the antigen antibody complex is located within their basement membrane. 
Okay, that's a good one. Let's move on to slide number three. This is tissue from a dog. I'm going to ask you for a morphologic diagnosis. Name the condition and give me two associated biochemical abnormalities. That's ClinPath, folks. I want two clinical pathologic abnormalities you may see in this particular dog. Okay, time's up. What a great picture. Okay, this particular person took a picture of not only the inside, which is fairly characteristic, but also the outside of this section of gut, so we can see everything that's going on. Okay, let's start with the name of the condition. The condition is known as lymphangiectasia. Um, it is a disease that is seen in certain breeds of dogs, such as soft-coated Wheaton Terriers, Yorkshire Terriers, and Norwegian Lundihunds, among others. And what we're looking at here is the mucosal surface and these little white patches, patches of lacteals, uh, excuse me, villi, in which the lacteals are markedly dilated and contain chyle, a high-fat uh, liquid. On the other side of this piece of gut, along the lymphatics, we see lipogranulomas, these little granulomas, because um, there's always inflammation within the draining lymphatics. Uh, lymphangiectasia can be, uh, it can be a breed-specific disease. It can be the result of neoplasia. It can be a result of uh, some sort of obstruction of the lymphatic system, but it's most often breed associated. The big deal with these particular animals is they are protein losing. It's a major cause of protein losing enteropathy in the dog. Before we get into the biochemical abnormalities in these animals, the morphologic diagnosis that I put on this is a diffuse intestinal lacteal dilatation with granulomatous lymphangitis. Okay, two associated abnormalities. Panhypoproteinemia, okay? Uh, there's also hypoalbuminemia. That'd be fine if you use that. These animals are often mildly hypocalcemic because calcium is often complex to albumin. If you don't have any albumin circulating, your, your calcium is gonna be a little bit lower because that's what's measured. And hypocholesterolemia, okay? Lymphangiectasia, fantastic picture. Okay, slide number four. It's a classic. Can you give me morphologic diagnosis and two, count them, two possible causes. This is tissue from a puppy. Okay, time's up. I told you it was a puppy for a very good reason because it'd be very difficult to get uh, two classic causes out of an adult dog. I could probably come up with a number of causes in an adult dog, but I like it that it's a puppy. Um, the morphologic diagnosis is multifocal to coalescing necrohemorrhagic nephritis. Now, some people always say, is it a nephritis? Well, you don't see a lot of inflammation in uh, these particular animals, but I was trained if you have an infectious agent, just go with an itis. It makes it a lot easier. Um, two possible causes this is classic puppy disease. Uh, number one would be the one that hits them until about 10 to 14 days of age when they can regulate their temperature. And that's canine herpes virus type 1. You will see necrosis, necrotic lesions in other organs as well, scattered throughout the body, such as the liver, spleen, lymph nodes, etc. But the classic, classic lesion is these coalescing areas of necrosis and hemorrhage. Remember, I didn't say hemorrhage and necrosis. I said necrosis and hemorrhage within the kidneys. The second disease goes out a little farther than that. Um, canine adenovirus type 1 can affect puppies up to about a month of age, and you will see uh, hemorrhage and necrosis, I'm sorry, necrosis and hemorrhage within the kidneys because this particular agent um, has tropism for a number of cells. Endothelial cells primarily will give you this lesion. Also has 
uh, tropism for mesothelial cells, so you will see some hemorrhage throughout the body on, on the capsule and the serosal surfaces. It also is tropic for hepatocytes, and that's the big deal in this particular, in canine antivirus type 1. It really goes after the liver. You'll see beautiful inclusions in the liver and a lot of necrosis. And then finally, it also has some tropism for renal epithelial cells, which might contribute to the damage to the kidneys. So canine herpes virus type 1 is always top of my list when I hear it's a puppy. Canine adenovirus has to be in there as well. Remember, canine adenovirus is the only thing that's going to cause hemorrhage and necrosis within the brain stem of a dog. So if you ever see that, especially a young dog, you've got a good idea what that's going to be. Okay, we are moving on to slide number five, which is tissue from a horse and I would like for you to give me a morphologic diagnosis and name a likely breed. Okay, time's up. Well, we're here in the brain of the horse, cerebrum, brainstem, and cerebellum. And I see a little extra space here within the cranium in the area of the cerebellum, and the folia look very moth-eaten, the, uh, the gray matter is gone in some areas, so the white matter looks a lot bigger than it should, and this extra space sort of clues me in. Of course, I'm going to look at the rest of the brain and look for a, a cholesteatoma or something like that, but just too much space here. Horses generally don't suffer from uh, cerebellar hypoplasia like we've seen in another, a number of other animal species, especially ruminants, but... Um, they do suffer, certain breeds suffer from a condition in which the brain is apparently normal at birth and then you have death of cells within the Purkinje cell layer and the neurons of the granular cell layer in some cases. And this is known as cerebellar abiotrophy. So the animals will be normal at birth and then over time they will develop ataxia. Um, the likely breed is an Arabian horse. If anyone ever asks me likely breed, I always say Arabian because um, they do seem to get uh, an, an abnormal amount of disease, but Arabians are the ones that, are, that this has been well documented in. So cerebellar abiotrophy, normal at birth, but progress, progressive degradation over time. Okay, slide number six. Give you a little extra history. This one's a fun one. This is from a marmoset. Marmoset's a small New World monkey, and it was kept in an outdoor enclosure. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, your time's up. Morphologic diagnosis is not too difficult. We have little white dit dots in the liver. These are areas of necrosis, variably sized, or they may be small abscesses. Okay, when I think of small abscesses, I'm just going to say multifocal necrotizing uh, hepatitis, or if you said multifocal paddock abscesses, I'm going to give you full credit. I will say, how about uh, multifocal embolic hepat suppurative hepatitis same thing you got all the words there so i'm going to give you a little bit of uh, credit here and this is a marmoset that was kept outdoors and one of the major causes of death in in non-human primates in outdoor enclosures is yersinia either yersinia enterocolitica or yersinia pseudotuberculosis you really can't tell the difference um except with pcr uh, histologically, you are going to see areas of necrosis in the intestine, in the mesenteric lymph nodes, in the spleen, and in the liver. This is, Yersinia is a hot gram negative, and most hot gram negatives will work that way. Um, and they really have great tropism for the white matter of the ileum, the mesenteric lymph nodes, and the spleen. Now, they get to the liver where they're very easily seen. These foci are very easily seen because when you get, as we said before, even in this lecture, you ulcerate the intestine, uh, bacteria have the ability to get down into the portal circulation. They go shooting up this highway straight to the liver. Now, the thing with uh, Yersinia is that it's carried by rodents. Rodents pee and they poop um, all over the place, and non-human primates like to chase them. Uh, my rule for non-human primate is if it can fit in the mouth, it goes in the mouth. 
and so they will uh, they will go ahead and smash these mice and they will eat them back in the day um, they were small pinky mice were used which weren't really well screened for diseases but your sin is very common and so animals that have access to the outside might come in contact with rodents so it's especially prominent in animals with from roadside zoos or collections so just remember that your cinia um, if you said any other hot gram negative I suppose I could go with Francisella tularensis although they don't track down rabbits but rodents can carry that uh, something like salmonella could be you know I couldn't tell the difference uh, grossly but I'm saying outdoor uh, primate, I'm thinking Yersinia. Gonna be top of my list. Okay, this is slide number seven. It's tissue from a foal. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. This one's a little tough. We're a little we're up a little close and when you get really close it's often tough difficult to distinguish uh, a lobe of the lung from a lobe of the liver I think we all have that trouble even deep into our careers one of the things that I'm looking at here is if you look there are some rib impressions they're very subtle but they're right here and then you can see the interlobular septa which are expanded because the lung is very edematous. Um, there are some little white dots which may represent foci of necrosis. If I am told it's a foal and there is an interstitial pneumonia with a lot of edema and maybe necrosis, equine herpes virus type 1 is going to be at the top of the list. Um, and we've had problems with equine herpes virus 1 in the U.S. for many years. I live in Maryland. We've had problems for 15 years with that. So usually uh, uh, it may go through a stable and the animals might get snotty noses, but uh, the animals that are pregnant are at risk. I'm going out this weekend to uh, vaccinate uh, our horse for equine rhinopneumonitis. It's time for the uh, annual vaccines, and, and you can't get into a stable stable in uh, Maryland without a, a current uh, vaccine for this. Okay, morphologic diagnosis, which I asked for. I'm going diffuse necrotizing interstitial pneumonia with edema. Now, always want to reinforce. A lot of people will say, uh, this is a diffuse interstitial pneumonia with edema. You've gotten halfway there. But when you say interstitial, that does not tell me what the process is. It simply tells me where it's located. It's focused on the alveolar septa or preferably the terminal, the junction of the terminal bronchial and the, the uh, alveolar septa to be specific, but it's a location. It doesn't tell me whether it's suppurative, lymphocytic, uh, and in this particular case, necrotizing. There's also going to be extensive necrosis in the uh, uh, lining of the airways. But remember, this animal's probably stillborn, probably did not get it from uh, inhaling this uh, as an adult animal would. It probably came, comes in through the bloodstream. So that's another little bit of reinforcement for interstitial edema. Uh, sorry, interstitial pneumonia with edema. Okay, slide number eight. Oh, what a beautiful slide. I love this slide. Okay, can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. I hope everybody recognizes at least we're at the skin. We have marked thickening and hyperkeratosis. This is multifocal coalescing hyperkeratotic dermatitis some tunnels in here that we see and this is the chronic lesion associated with Sarcoptes scabii variant suis but if you just said Sarcoptes scabii that would be fine why is this not pox well 
The entire skin is hyperkeratotic. There are no traditional pox, proliferative and necrotizing dermatitis lesions. Um, so when I think about something that is diffusely hyperkeratotic, one of the things I'm going to think about is sarcoptes, and it starts usually from the face around the ears, and it moves backwards over the pig. Um, there are other hyperkeratotic diseases in pigs, um, but this is a, a good, albeit a little bit up close and personal for sarcoptes scabies. So you didn't come up with that, don't feel too bad. That's sort of a fun slide, but I don't think it, it's particularly fair for a serious examination. But these little fun gross bath challenges, yeah, let's throw it at you. Okay, beautiful picture here, and it's tissue from a sheep, and I want you to give me an etiologic diagnosis. Now, we don't use that very much, um, but an etiologic diagnosis is only two words. It is the agent and the organ in which Ever order you want to put it. You can put the agent first, you can put the agent last. It makes no difference. Okay, time's up. Well, this is a not a very good looking uh, uh, liver. It is discolored, it is contracted, it probably is, has significant fibrosis, but one of the things that you'll see that within the bile ducts, there are a uh, Trematode parasite, and they better look down here. They're very small. They're not out in the parenchyma. They don't have the ability to occlude the ducts. The ducts have some fibrosis, not a major amount. And this is uh, the lancet fluke or dicrocelium dendriticum. You have a number of flukes in uh, in uh, ruminants, including fascial hepatica, much larger. Fasciloides magna, you can imagine, is much larger. And, and then dicrocelium dendriticum. There are a couple of other uh, minor players in that group. But the etiologic diagnosis that I'm looking for is biliary dicroceliomyosis. I think that sounds better than uh, dicrocelio cholidokitis. If, I guess if I would take full credit if you put that. But biliary dicro, dicrocelliomyces is what I am looking for. Uh, some of you might have written down biliary trematodiasis, and I'm going to give you three points out of four for that one. But you don't get full credit because I want you to be as specific as possible. And uh, so dicroceliomyces, dicrocelium dendriticum, is a fun fluke. Most of the flukes have a uh, uh, snail is an intermediate host, and then the dicrocelium often has a second intermediate host, which is an ant. And the myricidium gets in the ant, and believe it or not, it causes nocturnal wandering in ants. And so the ant, he works in the, in the little ant tunnels during the day, moving dirt or whatever his job or her job is, and uh, when the sun goes down, uh, the, for some reason, the, the ant that's infected with uh, dicrocelium goes mental. And it goes mental, and it goes climbs up to the top of the tall blades of grass, the tallest one it can find, and hangs on with, with his mandibles and just hangs there because that is how the life cycle is going to, to be completed, hopefully a... A ruminant is going to come along and eat that blade of grass, digest the ant, and release the myricidium uh, into its GI tract, beginning the life cycle. So very interesting. You can look that one up. I know it sounds crazy. Um, it sounds like I'm mental. But uh, look that one up, Dicrocelium dendriticum. It's a really fun life cycle. Okay. We have one more for today. This is tissue from a chicken. And I want you to give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, time's up. You know, when we deal with uh, skin lesions, there's a lot of times that you're going to get to use something, a word that represents this crusting or scaling. That word is hyperkeratotic. We've already used it once in this particular uh uh, challenge. So it's a great word. I, I find that I use when I'm doing uh, 
dermatopathology on a gross basis, the terms hyperkeratotic, alopecic, and ulcerative, or maybe necrotizing, um, are used in the vast majority of lesions. So hyperkeratosis, when you see this crusting, and you see this scaling, and much like the uh, slide number eight, where we had hyperkeratosis in pig, this is also the province uh, in poultry and in small companion birds like uh, parakeets. It is the province of a sarcoptid mite. And those are the mites that live in the crusts of the skin. They lay their eggs in the crust of the skin, and the skin responds by a tremendous scaling and crusting and hyperkeratotic response. In the chicken, this is Nematocoptes mutans. Um, in budgerigers or parakeets, it's Nematocoptes pili. It can also affect the, uh, the unhaired skin of the face in the parakeet, particularly the sear and the beak, uh, but it's more restricted to feet in poultry. Nematocoptes mutans for poultry and Nematocoptes pili for parakeets. Okay, well, that's it for this Gross Path Challenge. I hope that you have enjoyed it and you'll come back for more uh, Gross Path Challenges. We'll be moving forward with a combination of both the Multiple Choice uh, Gross Path Challenge, which allowed me to drill a little deeper into the current literature and uh, uh, the current uh, textbooks out there like Joe and Kennedy. And then we're going to have some more of these, which allow me just to talk about the agents. And, and we can talk about formulating morphologic and etiologic diagnoses. Okay, well, that's it for today. I wish you a fantastic day. I wish you wonderful health. And I wish that you would come back to the Foundation's YouTube channel or the AF, uh, JPC's uh, video library to view more of these gross path challenges or maybe some of the other lectures on gross pathology of various species or systems in domestic animals. I hope everybody has a wonderful day.